Joining us now, Harry Littman, a former U.S. attorney, deputy assistant attorney general during the Clinton administration, who was in the court for yesterday's arguments, and Linda Greenhouse, clinical lecturer in law and senior research scholar at Yale Law School. So, Harry, your prediction last month was that it could be seven to two, and you saw it coming, because that sure is the way it felt. Could even be nine zip, but certainly it seemed lopsided in terms of the skepticism they expressed about a lot of ambiguity in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Yeah, it did feel that way to me from the start, mainly because notwithstanding whatever the merits were under Section 3, and they didn't talk about that all that much, much less Donald Trump, it just seemed like a result that the court couldn't countenance. And that's the feel you got from the argument yesterday. It's not clear to most people, including me, what their bottom line will be, how they'll get there. But yes, I think seven, eight, maybe even nine justices will coalesce around something here. And we, there were esteemed Supreme Court scholars, you know, jurists like Judge Liddick, uh, Linda, who think that you know, it's very clear that the 14th Amendment is crystal clear, that very obviously they would say the president of the United States is an officer of the court. Um, I don't know what, what you thought of the argument and whether or not it would have been different if Jack Smith had indicted Donald Trump for incitement or some sort of insurrection yeah, related I actually uh, don't. charge. It was a very clarifying argument. I may be the only person left in the country who went into this argument agnostic. I really, I thought there were strong arguments on both sides. What, what happened, I think, is that uh, Jonathan Mitchell, Trump, Trump's lawyer, was very successful from the get-go in emphasizing every possible ambiguity about Section 3, which, of course, you know, most people in the country never heard of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment until a few months ago, and the court has never construed it. So it's ambiguous whether it applies to the president, and it's ambiguous whether states have the ability to enforce it on their own, many ambiguities. And and he, Trump's lawyer, was talking from strength in that all you have to do is persuade a majority of justices, let alone all of them, that there's enough ambiguity to hold back. Whereas the two lawyers arguing for Colorado had to bat away every possible ambiguity and assure the court that there was every reason to go forward and do something that many people would view as rather radical. Uh, so the, the kind of burden of proof was really on the Colorado side. And I, I, I think I, I agree with the general consensus that by the end of the very intense two hours, uh, Colorado just hadn't met that burden. They didn't talk that much, Harry, about insurrection at all, in fact. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of focus on history. And interestingly, Katenji Jackson, Judge Katenji Brown Jackson, saying that what the, the authors of the 14th Amendment wanted to do was stop states from being too aggressive and allowing, you know, uh, you know insurrectionists, rebels, <laughs> to get into their midst, rather than empowering states to have the rights to put people on the ballot. That's right. And the Chief Justice also said, hey, wait a minute, the 14th Amendment is about constraining state power. Why would we use this in such an expansive way? Justice Jackson was probing the question whether, in fact, the uh, president should be excluded from the text and giving a reason that it might be that really the 14th Amendment drafters were worried about uh, former union people kind of burrowing in. But I thought it was very interesting because all in all, Trump was kind of the missing man. And even the text of the 14th Amendment, especially engaged in insurrection, wasn't uh, a dominant player. The real concern, I think, Roberts, Kagan, others, was just the consequences. That's the word they used of affirming and their assumption that it would cascade and create an overall sort of, at best, crazy quilt pattern in the whole country.